and welcome to Fact Schmacks. It's the podcast good enough to get you a C. Minus. My name's Matt. I got a story to tell you. My name's Kev. I have a story to interrupt. <laughs> All righty, Kevin. Okay, Matthew. How about we play Facts Schmacks? Facts the Schmacks? The hit game. The hit game from our podcast. All right. Well, I got a, I got a good one for you. Okay, as so, you always do. So we're rolling in, uh, you know, I don't know where you're listening, but at this current time, we're uh, we're a little locked down again because of this whole business. I don't know if you've heard of COVID. It's oh, I haven't noticed. It's for a different show. Anyhow, so uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time indoors. Probably going to be, uh, I, I know you're pretty good, Matt. You're going to be playing some games. I might be playing a few video games. Surfing the net, maybe playing on the computer a bit. Uh, less than that, but yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. A lot of YouTube. Okay. So mm-hmm. what do you know about these things? Let's find out. Let's test your knowledge. About video games? Video games, computers, internet, whatever. All right. Let's fire Hit away with our first fact or schmacked. Let's do it. Fact or schmacked, Matt. Jack the Ripper was still active when Nintendo was formed. <laughs> That's uh that's a good one. I yeah, Nintendo is a very very old company. They started making uh trading cards um back. So there used to be part of uh like Japanese in Japanese history at one point they had trading cards that they got from Dutch people and they really liked it and then the emperors said no trading cards. Uh, and then they made their own kind of sort of trading cards that kind of skirted the rules. And Nintendo was one of the companies that made those cards. So, yeah, I, I absolutely believe that's true. Really? Is, yeah, it's formed in like 18 something or other. Yeah, yeah, it's a very okay. old company. So our yep. next factor schmacked is uh-huh. Netflix is older than Google. Ooh. Oh, that's also, oh, that's fun. They might be. Okay. You, you, you know, it used to be uh, uh, video by mail. Mm-hmm. 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 But when? It used to almost be part of Blockbuster, and the Blockbuster bought, thought it was a dumb idea. Interesting. Isn't that okay. funny? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So our last, our last fact or schmacked here is IBM, the company, was founded in 1894. Oh. I have no idea how old International Business Machine is. I mean, presumably they're pretty old. They're at least as old as the, you know, the 60s because they're right in there, you know, at the beginning of microprocessors. But when? When did old IBM start? So these That's are the my, question. These are my facts, schmacks for you this week. This is... This is what you've laid at my feet this week. Mm-hmm. Huh. All right. So if I'm going like the Nintendo one, that's true. Absolutely. Jack the Ripper's doing his thing, 1850s or so. Uh, Nintendo's founded um, in the 1800s. Uh, th- th- yeah, th- I, I believe that. That, sure. that checks out. So we're down to a 50-50. Uh, Do you want to phone a friend or pull the audience? <laughs> well, neither thing's really possible. No. Um, so I'm not sure... Um, how the, you know, feel, yeah, audience, feel free to shout out your answer now. Um, okay. So the second one again was that Netflix is older than Google, older than Google. That's going to be close, man. That's going to be close. Like Google was not one of the first, uh, search engine companies. You know, they weren't like a, your Lycos or your web crawler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ask, ask Jeeves. Remember, ask Jeeves. Ask, I asked Jeeves. Not really, actually. I never used Ask Jeeves. That was that was lame. Okay. Um. Yeah, you know what? I think it's the third one is the schmacked. God damn it! The IBM. Yeah. Yep. You know, I really thought I had gold with the Nintendo being as old as Jack the Ripper, but I should have known when someone is as pale. And as Nintendo savvy <laughs> as you are, that you would know every single goddamn thing about Nintendo. I should have known. It's I've, my fault. I read a, 
there's actually there's a really good book about the uh the console war between sega and nintendo like the you know the genesis era war and it, uh, uh, there's a whole chapter that goes through the history of nintendo that's the only reason that i know that but it's a yeah it's a really good book uh console wars i think it's called um yeah I, that's actually one of the you know look that look out for that in a future episode is just that exactly that like second versus nintendo genesis super nintendo uh square off there because it's a fun story but wow. not for now not mm-hmm. for now i oh, not man, for now. i was so like adamant that i was walking around the house i was like i'm gonna crush him today at fact schmacks he'll never believe this because i heard it and i was like no way oh however counterpoint way yeah okay yeah well carrying on carrying on um so my musing for today is about a a myth in popular culture i don't know about a myth but like a, a more like a chain email i guess that that goes around it's a set of extraordinary coincidences between presidents abraham lincoln and, oh, John F. and John F. Kennedy about the whole one went to a theater, one went to a warehouse. One was, no, it was one was, uh, you know, uh, Lincoln was shot in Ford Theater and uh, Ford was shot in a Lincoln. Oh, I also heard it that like John Wilkes Booth shot him in a theater and then hit out in a warehouse, whereas uh, Lee Harvey Oswald shot from yes. a warehouse then hit out in a theater. Yes. Um, Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. Uh, Lincoln was elected president in 1860. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. Um, uh, you know, there is, uh, um, both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both presidents were shot in the head. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's just a, there's a big list of, of these coincidences there. And there's just kind of, there's two things um, about it. Like, it's not that remarkable that you'd be able to find that many things that two people would have in common. And some of them just aren't even remarkable at all. Like, you know, there's elections every four years, right? So there's a bunch of years that are ruled out when you're talking about, um, you know, pre- people being elected, you know, there was nobody elected to Congress in 1847. There's nobody collected, elected to Congress in 1967. There's only elections on certain years. So can't they um, have like a snap election or like a, what is it where they kind of not impeach somebody, but they have like a thing where they, like, I know in Canada they can call a snap we have, election. No, we, yeah, we do snap elections in Canada. I don't think that's as common in the, in the States. I think that's a very specific Um, yeah, but I'm not as well versed in, in that system as I am in ours. Uh, but either way, you know, normally there's only elections in certain years, you know, if they were both elected, you know, 105 years apart, would that be, or 104 years apart instead of a hundred years apart, 96 years apart instead of, you know, a hundred years apart, would that be any more or less remarkable? It's just because we think that, you know, round numbers are fun. Both were shot well, on a Friday. Fun. That's a that's a one in seven chance. Come on. That's a one in seven chance. Both were shot in the head. You never tell me the odds. Well, if you're trying to kill somebody, you're generally going to either shoot them in the head or the heart. And, you know, so that's a one in two chance that they're going to get shot in the same uh, spot. And some of the stuff on the list just turns out to be wrong. But really the bigger point is like, you know, There was a ton that they didn't have in common. You know, for example, they were born in different years. They were different Uh, parties, weren't they? Like they were different parties. Exactly. Yes, they're different parties. Um, You know, there there's a lot. uh, Yeah, there's just a ton that they did not have in common. It's you if you sit if you try to think about how many actual things there are about a person when you consider like just events that they're connected to uh being one of those things or like you know just element the the way their name is spelled um you know that sort of stuff there's probably like a million things that make up you uh and a million things that make up me and i'm sure we can find a dozen things that are like spooky coincidences between the two of us but that leaves you know a lot more that that isn't a spooky coincidence okay that makes sense. 
Yeah. I like it. It's just, uh, we're, you know, we're just, it's another example of how we're just not really intuitively designed to understand statistics and coincidences and what, you know, constitutes but that I, sort But I of think thing. people like looking for patterns. They like Absolutely. to find the, the little... The little nuggets, you know, for sh- oh, for sure they do. That's and I mean, there's a good reason because your your brain is constantly trying to make sense of of the world around it. I mean, it's the reason that um, you sometimes hear your name if you don't, you know, even you know, in the middle of a conversation because your brain's always listening for it. Uh, and if you hear something, you know, that's close enough to Ev or Evan, you know, for example, for you, uh, I can tell you in that regard, being a Matt, my life is hell. Uh, there's a million things that rhyme with or sound like Matt, so True. I'm constantly like, huh, what, huh, huh, no. I only have Not seven me. and heaven, I think. Yeah, there you go. So there's mm-hmm. that. But it Must uh, be nice for you. Yeah, it's not too shabby. Mm-hmm. Well, there's Matt's musing, and now we're all richer for the experience. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of trying, oh, oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Ah, Speaking of stories, and when you're trying to get into the next segment, yeah, just won't. Okay, sorry. No, no, go ahead. One more. uh, Okay, no, go ahead. (laughs) Is this a standoff? (laughs) It sure is. All right, all right, carry on. So, speaking of trying to get oneself richer, uh, there are a lot of different ways to get oneself richer. We've done sort of true crime on this podcast before. We flirted with it with Ken Rex McElroy, and that's that's a very interesting story. And this is going to flirt pretty close to that line as well. It's more of a mystery, but I think it's going to be one that's considerably more fun than uh, than that one was. So on November 24th, 1971, middle-aged man in a snappy suit and pair of real cool sunglasses. I know what this is about, <laughs> and I love it. And he's carrying a briefcase. He, he walks into Northwest Orient Airlines at Portland International, or sort of walks into Portland International Airport and walks up to the Northwest Orient Airlines counter, and he buys a ticket to go That's from a Portland one-way to ticket. Seattle. A one-way ticket. Absolutely. Pays with cash. 20 bucks he pays. Uh, for a ticket and under the name of Dan Cooper. Now, I'm sure everybody now knows exactly who we're talking about. He, he, he takes a 30 minute flight while he's getting on the plane. He doesn't really do anything to distinguish himself from other passengers. He sits in the back of the plane, very back row, sits apparently in the middle of the uh, of the seats, orders himself a nice bourbon Um and waits for takeoff. He's on a 727, very specific type of plane uh, that I think he, you know, we're going to find out he chose for very specific reasons. Shortly after takeoff, he hands a note to a stewardess named Florence Schaffner, or a flight attendant, sorry, I should say. She would have been a stewardess at the time, but I should say flight attendant now. Uh, and the letter That's very woke. said that, yes, said that uh, he had a bomb. Uh, now she... She originally was pretty used to businessmen getting on planes and flirting with her. So she just put the note in, in her pocket thinking that it was just his phone number or something. So <laughs> I guess he had to wait till she came back and, uh, oh, give me one moment here. <coughs> sounds like, sounds the vid. Yeah. Uh, I guess he had to wait till she came back, uh, to say like, Hey, um, you should look at that letter. I've got a bomb. So he, she sat down beside him. She looked in, at the letter. You know, it apparently contained, there's a couple of phrases that everybody says that it contained. It asked for $200,000 in negotiable American currency, allegedly. Um, allegedly. Allegedly, because allegedly. He, he, he was very smart. He took the letter. We don't actually have a copy of it. We just, uh, we just have what the pilot and the, uh, the flight attendant remember uh, he asked for two hundred thousand uh, American sorry two hundred thousand dollars in negotiable American currency. He asks for four parachutes, two primary chutes, and two rear chutes, and a fuel truck to be waiting for them in Seattle. Now, 
she sits down beside him and he opens up his little briefcase there and she you know says she saw um i think four or eight stick red sticks with some wires going into a battery looked very much like a bomb but you know who knows nobody ever recovered what it was so it was obviously meant to look like a bomb yeah no doubt it's easy enough to fake right a couple right. Ro- couple road flares and an alarm clock and yeah and i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't hazard that it isn't right for sure um, yeah err on the side of caution for sure now all this takes a while to arrange you can't get this done within a 30 minute flight um but they don't want to cause a panic or anything the the guy who runs the airline to his credit he immediately agrees to uh pay their pay the ransom he's going to pay him off no problem but it does take some time to get this money together they get the fbi involved right away um they take money from, uh, I think it was the Bank of Seattle had like actually had a, a stash of money set aside that had the serial numbers already recorded exactly for this sort of thing, I guess. Like so really? large companies, if they're being extorted, could get like a, a stash of pre-recorded bills. Is that no, normal? I will. Is that normal? I will say as somebody who's who's worked in a bank, uh, I won't say which bank and I'm not won't say disclose really anything about how we operate. Um, but that's not something that you would just be able to walk into a branch and get, uh, for sure. Um, huh. yeah, a bunch of like marked bills. You wouldn't be able to. Yeah. So th- that would have been like a central bank, like a corporate office or something that would have had that set aside. But things are also, you know, we're different back in the day. You know, now we live in a cashless society. So I don't know, like, I don't know what things were like. So now in order to not. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah no oof. as a little aside here uh you know a lot of the scams that we ran into you know if you get one of those calls from the cra and you live in the town that i live in uh you know calls from the cra have in in air quotes they're ultimately gonna or a lot of them are ultimately gonna try to direct you to a certain atm machine w- that lets you deposit bitcoin directly into wallets yeah and then your money is gone yeah yeah, <clears throat> that's what they uh, uh, that's what they use is Bitcoin or different cryptocurrencies. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so in order to keep the the you know passengers who are on this plane from really knowing that things are 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 bad for them, um, the pilot thinking quick because this is you know in the seventies this is in an era where you're a commercial pilot, there's a good chance that you like you were flying in World War II, for example. And this this guy is exactly that sort of guy. He, he had flown in World War II. He's used to haywire situations. Um, he immediately, you know, begins arranging things between the company, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the hijacker. He tells the passengers on the plane that there's a mechanical issue and they need to, to you know, just kind of hang around the airport. So they were circling around the airport for two hours while everything was getting put into place. Um, but they, you know, got it all together. They landed. The ransom money was handed over to uh, one of the flight attendants through the through the back stairwell there. You know, DB Cooper, or Dan Cooper, sorry, gets his money. Uh, he uh, allows all of the passengers and some of the flight crew to leave the plane at this point. Well, keeps on decent, the man. pilots. Yeah, he keeps on the pilots. He keeps on this uh, flight attendant named Tina Mucklow. Uh, and he demands that they're going to, they refuel the plane and they fly the plane to Mexico, Mexico. Which is Mexico, which at the time, like skyjackings were a lot more common back in the day, especially like, <clears throat> yeah, fly they, me to it. Sorry, didn't they have like a Iran or something? Uh, there was some kind of big hostage situation in the seventies. Um, oh, that was the Olympics. That maybe I'm thinking of, but there was one on a plane. Well, the, uh, there's a famous one back then. No, nothing. Yes. yes. Um, well, there was like the you know they they had to get those people out of uh, Iran in the seventies. I don't know if that's what you're but like there were there were examples of skyjacking where it's just like, yeah, take me to this place so I can either like claim asylum or I'm gonna, you know, in this case I'm gonna take the money and I'm, you know, I'm gonna go to Mexico and I'm free and clear. So but he does have a couple demands. Uh he wants them to fly the plane at a maximum height of ten thousand feet with their landing gear deployed the whole time. 
Wings flap lowered, wing flaps, sorry, lowered to 15 degrees. And let me tell you, as an expert aviator, I 1000% understand the implications of that. No so idea. I have slow. no idea why that's, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I believe that's the case, but I don't, yeah. I think that he asked for that means he clearly was familiar, at least in some respect, with planes more than the average person would be. Uh, and that the cabin uh, not be pressurized the entire time. Um, there was some finagling over, um, uh, all of that. Be, uh, it turns out that, you know, if you want to fly a plane unpressurized at 10,000 feet with the landing gear down and your flaps up like that, you're going to really going to reduce the range of your plane. So you're going to need to stop and fuel somewhere. If you're going to get to Mexico, Cooper says, fine. They agree on Reno, Nevada. Um, at this point, that's all he's really specified is take me to Mexico and we're going to stop in Reno, Nevada on the way. Other than that, he hasn't specified a specific route he wants them to take. Um, you know, there's all sorts of like kind of laneways, so to speak, that that pilots will get on. They can, you know, get on one or the other. He didn't have any preference as to basically where he was going to be flying over. Unless he already knew specifically that this route that he, I don't know. I don't know. It, it see, this part of it seems very random to me. But at seven, uh, he also, sorry, he also wanted them to take off with the rear stairs down. Uh, but the airline objected to that. They said, absolutely no way. Can't do that. It's a danger to the, the crew. It's a danger to the plane. Um, Cooper apparently said, I, I absolutely know it's safe, but that's fine. Sure. Whatever. Uh, so he, he relented on that. Let them take the, put the stairs up. Um, but he did, you know, stipulate that one of the flight crew had to stay and, and show him how to lower these stairs when he, you know, when, when he wanted them to. So 7.40 PM, the aircraft takes off. It's shadowed by two F-106 fighters. Now, again, just to go over this plane for a second, it's a 727 and there's a couple interesting things about the way this plane is designed. It has a stairwell uh, that comes off the back of the plane. They don't do that as much anymore. It was, you know, pretty unique at the time. The other thing is that the engines... <clears throat> were considered to be mounted uh, high. Um, now, just one question. Yep. When you say a stairwell at the back of the plane, do you mean at the tail section? Yeah. Or like tangent, tangent, I'm not, oh, fuck it. Like on the side at the back. Like, do you mean like the back? No, like no, cargo extending ramp? straight down the back. Oh, okay. So imagine like basically the the end of the tail just being able to like pop that out. Almost like a fairy, you know, pops the, the front of their... You know, so, so it would drop down it, a set of stairs because I was picturing, yeah, drop, <clears throat> picturing it like the the rear stairs of. of yeah, no, it doesn't come out the side of the plane. That's it goes directly okay. out. Yeah, so you'd be yeah. Um. So yeah, seven forty p.m. Plane takes off. It's shadowed by two F one hundred six uh, fighters. Cooper gets uh, Tina Mucklow, this this flight attendant, to show him uh, how to lower the staircase, and, and then he tells her to take off and go join the rest of the crew in the, in the cockpit and lock the door. Take off, Don't come yeah. out. Yeah. Take off. Funny. You, you phrased it like that. We'll get into that later, but, uh, he tells her to take off hose head and, uh, <laughs> lock the door. Don't you bother coming out until we land in Reno at 8 PM. Well, sorry. And as she's, she's, she's leaving, she sees him tying something to his waist. That's part of the story that often gets told. Probably the money, I'm guessing. He was trying to tie the money to his waist, but he was tying something to his waist. At 8 p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit to say that the air stairs, which is what they call them, the air stairs, uh, had been lowered. And at 8.13 p.m., the crew felt a sudden upward movement from the tail section of the plane. They actually had to adjust the trim to get back to level flight. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was it until 10, 15, when they landed, they, you know, the police rushed into, or they, the first, the crew kind of cautiously looked out. They didn't see him. They exit the plane, you know, police go in, confirm he's not in there anymore. Rear stairwell, the plane was damaged in the flight. So, you know, the, the, the prevailing theory is at 8, 13 PM when the crew felt that little upward, uh, lift from the tail section that was him jumping off he probably pushed down at the very edge of the plane to jump off and then once his weight wasn't on there you know the the, the tail section shot up a little bit and they had to to adjust a little bit 
Well, I would think too in the in the wind, uh, the airstream up there would be pretty, pretty intense. That's probably why they couldn't fly or take off with it down because, you know that, <clears throat> like you stick your hand out the car or the window when you're driving. That's you know that's a lot of force. You imagine something flying. Yeah, and well, he, now he did tell them that they. Uh, the other thing, sorry, was that they had to go at the lowest possible speed, and that's a beer. Uh, that was a beer. That's beer number two, which is pretty standard for me. I'm usually a two beer podcaster. Just in case anybody was curious <laughs> as to the uh, <laughs> the quality of this uh, this year program, so they did gather some evidence from the plane. Um, they gathered a black clip-on tie with a mother of pearl tie clip uh, and eight cigarette butts, although they lost those cigarette butts, which is a uh, real shame because that would have been an excellent source of DNA evidence all these years later. For sure it would have been. Yeah. And like with everybody would, doing the 93 and me or whatever. Yeah, is. the genealogy thing, right? Yeah, that's how they caught the one serial killer not too long ago. The Golden State Killer. There's been yeah. a couple of killers that they found like that. Isn't that wild? That is wild. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they they found they there were two parachutes that were left behind. Um, but here's the thing: they were trying to get parachutes together really quick. Do you know where to get a parachute? No, I don't know where to get a parachute. So they're you know. Presumably like flight plane people do, but they had to kind of put this together quick. And in their haste, the FBI there, they accidentally, and they swear this was an accident, they included a dummy shoot that was only intended for training purposes. There were four shoots that they gave. There were two civilian kind of luxury shoots. There was a military, considered like an older, less steerable type of uh, parachute. And then there was a... Uh, um. Uh, sorry, I just got shoot? an email that I'm. Yeah, then there was the 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 dummy shoot. The two that were taken uh, were the military shoot and the dummy shoot. So it's possible that he used the dummy shoot to keep the money in, and he used the you know the the, the real shoot to you know the military shoot uh, and and lived. But you know maybe it was the other way around and. He used to not put a non-functional shoot on his back. Nobody knows. Uh, he was never found. No, no body was ever found, uh, which you'd be looking for kind of a needle in a haystack there. He was, he, he parachuted into the area that he, he jumped off the plane uh, was over the wilderness of uh, Washington state uh, kind of, I think, Northern Washington. It, it wasn't very long after they took off anyways. So he's, he jumped into a wooden area, but it could have kind of been anywhere. Nobody's exactly sure where the plane was. They know pretty sure what time he jumped, but you know, nobody ever found a body. So nobody's really sure if he, you know, lived or died, but it is interesting that one of the, of the four shoots that he grabbed, he made objectively kind of the two worst choices. Um, a placard that had been on the stairwell was found in 1978 by a, a deer hunter. And it was found in kind of the area that they had thought, you know, stuff should be found that, that a body should be found or a parachute. So they spent a bunch of time looking in that area, but they were never able to find anything. Could you imagine? The only, <clears throat> excuse me. Could you imagine coming across that? You're out hunting deers, and then you find this placard from a freaking airplane that DB Cooper jumped off. Yeah, like, and what and a find! I'm sure the story, like the story, was super famous. I'm. I don't know. I don't know how quickly he would have known that that was, you know, that was the case. But yeah, that's uh, that would have been wild to find. Even more wild to find if you're an eight year old boy named Brian Ingram. In Feb on February 10th of 1980, uh, which, you know, just to remind you there, uh, that's nine years after the, the skyjacking took place, um, he found three packets of the ransom cash buried on a beach. What? No way. Yeah. So he found three, three bundles. So there, it would have been, um, 
uh, if, if I mean, if they're, I don't know how they're defining bundles there. I, I, maybe they're bundles of 10,000 bills, but, uh, but he found, um, either way, one of he found two full bundles and one of them was missing like 20 bills or something, but they were all in, in, they were all really degraded, but otherwise stuck together. It's very interesting that one of the bundles was short. Um, there's also a lot of heated debate in the DB Cooper community as to the placement of these um, bundles of money, because there's some evidence that says that nine years later, the elastic bands that held these bundles together wouldn't have lasted. They should have basically disintegrated a long time ago. The money should have been scattered around. It shouldn't have been able to to stick together. And as, as somebody who's worked in an office environment and dealt with a lot of very old elastic bands, I know exactly what they're talking about. They just kind of disintegrate when, yeah. when they're, they're in use for a long time. Um, there's also, you know, if the, the, the drop zone was where the police original or the, the police and the FBI originally thought it was, then the money would have gone the wrong way uh, up the river. It would have been carried up the river. Maybe an animal did it at that point, but, you know, that could also just be that the landing zone is off, that he actually landed, you know, further north and it would have gone down the river. You know, it's 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 a question of, is this money, did, was this money deliberately buried because some of one of the bundles is missing and that's kind of interesting. Yeah, like uh, and maybe if it, rip a cash and then stash the rest. Right. Um you know, was it deliberately buried? Now, some people think because of the the um, the the, the non degradation of the bands that it maybe even would have had to have been buried like later. Um, it's there's also this uh, algae analysis that was done of these things called diatoms, which are like a type of seasonal algae, I guess, um, and they that seemed to suggest that the bills were not buried at the time of the the hijacking they had algae on them that would have been from later in the season supposedly so it's kind of inconclusive what this really means it's a frustrating piece of evidence that points in a bunch of different directions you know it's easy to it, it could just as easily be that he dropped it on the air staircase before he jumped out, ju- jumped out and it got carried down the river and, you know, naturally buried by some process. Uh, it could be that, you know, he deliberately buried it uh, on his way out. We just don't know. There was also a small DNA sample they found from the tie, but, uh, that you know, there's really no way of knowing. You know, we, we were kind of talking uh with our fast facts back there about the the ease in which DNA can be transferred, um, right. you know, you can't really say unless you've got something to compare it to um, or unless it's found in like, you know, a very like if it's like semen or something like yeah, or blood yeah. where it's, found, you know, that's, you know, that's uh, you're right. Yeah. But just a random piece of DNA that could be from anywhere that could have been from the guy that sold him the ticket or the guy uh, who picked up the tie afterwards. <clears throat> like it could have been right. anywhere. Could have been from anywhere. It would have been really nice to have had those cigarette butts, though. Let me tell you. Yeah, um, that would have been pretty, uh, pretty conclusive. Pretty, I think DNA. P- pretty, pretty swell. In two thousand nine, um, an electron microscope uh, was used to investigate the tie, and they apparently found a bunch of rare earth metals on the tie. That's kind of interesting because in nineteen seventy, how do you get a bunch of rare earth metals on your tie? You know, that they would have been considerably rarer things, right? Sure. Yeah, like... Uh, like, what do you mean so by rare earth metals? Things like titanium, um, things that would have been used in very specific manufacturing industries at the time, Okay, basically. So that actually, you know, that's a more interesting evidence piece of evidence than maybe uh, that would suggest because... That would mean that this person was bringing a tie into like manufacturing environments. He would have been like a foreman manager, yeah. foreman, engineer, something like that. But it is, it's an interesting piece of evidence nonetheless. There was only so many ways in 1970 that you got this stuff on a tie. And how old did they I figure he was? Uh, mid 40s is the common guess. So mid 40s, and it's not. 19- is the common, like that's what the. We're actually about to get into that. Like who the hell was he? Uh, both flight attendants described him as 5'10", 
mid 40s, 180 pounds, close set piercing brown eyes. And, and I specifically, I took this because, oh, I love this description swarthy skin. Swarthy. Do you know, do you know what swarthy is? Like kind of weathered. Yeah, it's a very like, old fashioned way of saying like either weathered or like olive skin, like tall, tall, dark, and handsome. Okay. And it's it's a word that I think quite like rightly has fallen out of fashion because I never want to be described as swarthy. <laughs> and I never will be described as swarthy. That's Swampy. for damn sure. Yeah. Much more likely. <laughs> uh, he might have been an army vet. See, that's you know, what I was, was going to say. Like, he's the right age to be maybe like a paratrooper or something from Korea. Yeah. Uh, or Vietnam. Vietnam like or Vietnam, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's, there's a lot of speculation that that is the case. Um, he at least was familiar with the location of an Air Force base that they were circling close by. I guess when they were circling around the Seattle airport, waiting for everything to kind of get arranged down there. He pointed out that there's an Air Force base 20 f- miles away, and he was absolutely correct. Um, it, that also might explain why he took the Army parachute if he was a paratrooper. Yeah, because he'd be more familiar. Well, I've seen this, you know. I've used one of these yeah. before, Old Faithful. Although there there are... Um, I saw at least somewhere that he requested non-military shoots, so I'm, I don't know how much stock to put into that. But... Uh, he, he he apparently told the uh, the flight attendant he was he was said to have been very like very nice very concerned about you know their um you know comfort i guess not like a didn't seem like a bad dude just said he he had a grudge in general not against like them or anything or their particular airline um the alias dan cooper is kind of interesting there was a comic book a belgian comic book that you could get in French Canada that was about the the exploits of a fighter pilot test pilot named Dan Cooper in the RCAF uh, and that's that's kind of interesting he could have been a bilingual Canadian he was said to have had no real accent um, but uh, it's you know it's very possible that he could have been a bilingual Canadian why do you say bilingual if there's no indication you spoke French uh, because he you know you could be well I mean there's lots of people that speak um, English quite fluently and yeah, like I mean, you know, French well right, enough, right? Right beside Quebec, I'm sure the was it specifically right. in French these comic books? Yes, so you oh, would okay, have to get this saying. comic book in French, but you know also speak English well enough. So yeah, you could be a bilingual I mean, I know Canadian. tons of people yeah. who are bilingual, and you would never know. Right? Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> I just I, I, it took me a interpret to, the question as like, can people be bilingual? No, it just took me a sec to figure out like if there was any other indication that I was like, oh, the comic oh, book yeah. is in French. So sorry, it, sorry, it's it, it's it's a Belgian comic book, yeah. So I yeah, I took for granted that that's it would be written in French, right? Yeah, because it could yeah. have been written in Belgian or translated to different languages, right? Like, is Bel- Belgians a language? <laughs> Isn't it? Don't they, they don't they have a language? No, they, I don't know. No, they speak French. And- <laughs> Do they in Belgium? Yeah, or, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure. Anyways, the comic book was in French. That's going to be, uh, that's potential future FSQA <laughs> segment. <laughs> um, yeah, but he did, uh, he, another thing though, the type of plane that he picked, that 727, the CIA was typically using that, those planes to, to drop operatives and supplies in the CIA kind of exactly in the same fashion that he would he escaped the plane. So there's, you know, obviously some speculation that, you know, he's, he was involved with the CIA or at least knowledgeable enough about th- what they did to know that, you know, if you're going to do this sort of thing, this is the kind of plane you want to do it from. Let's, let's just uh, face the facts here, like the fact schmacks. We got a dude who... Basically got two hundred thousand dollars and jumped out of an airplane. Like this is a badass. You don't just for sure. Yeah, you don't just sit in your office and decide that. Yeah, I'm gonna go do this and I'm gonna pull it off. Like this, it, doing that's got to take stones, right? Like this guy, sure. this guy's guaranteed seen some shit in his day, or or somebody who is incredibly desperate. I don't know, man. Desperate people don't make like I don't think a desperate person would make such a 
awesome. Like that's a power play. That's a power for sure. move. And and for how calm he apparently was yeah. the whole time. Yeah, like somebody the desperate only, would have been freaking out. The only thing I really have trouble with with his whole you know demeanor, his his cool thing, is the clip on tie. You know who I think it was. He couldn't have done like a half Windsor, man. Like what's going on here? You got a clip on tie? No, man. Everybody knows that if you're a man of action, you need a clip on tie so no one can choke you out with it. Mm. Actually, 100%. that's a really good explanation for that. 100%. That's the best explanation I've ever heard my gra- for my, how this supposedly my, cool guy. My grandpa was a bartender and that was his thing. He always wore a clip on tie because when shit got real, nobody, <laughs> was, grabbing grabbing the tie. The, nobody was grabbing him by the, <laughs> by the tie, right? So that's the thing. Um, but yeah, no, huh? uh, you know who my theory is? Who's your theory? Wilford fucking Brimley. <laughs> <laughs> we already know from one of our first episodes, that man is a badass. You know what the, fu- the, the thing we're not actually going to do on this podcast, because so much of the, the suspects are, the, that discussion is wrapped up in the actual mug or not the mug shop, but the, the composite image that they they drew of the suspect. I, 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 the suspect conversation to me is a lot less interesting as the than the. Do you think this guy made it? Do you think he lived? Oh yeah, like I want to believe on this one. For I sure. totally want to believe. So okay, let's look at the facts against. Let's look at the reasons why he maybe might not have made it. And then we're going to look at the reasons, maybe the, the, in my mind, the, the best reason why he probably did. Um, but he jumped out of this plane in a suit and a trench coat, not in like, you know, special gear for uh, a November night in Washington. So not really particularly warm. It would have been about negative nine Celsius at, you know, the, the point that he's jumping. Yeah, but you're would up have there had for the like wind- three minutes. I go Actually, on my would back porch right now and it's minus 10. For sure. But you're not getting blasted with that wind in your face. Like a negative nine wind getting absolutely blasted at you uh, at like, you know, maybe more than 100 miles per hour. Uh, conditions were poor. It was storming. It was dark. And he's parachuting into a forest. He wouldn't have even been able to see where the ground was. There's speculation that maybe he didn't even get his chute open. He wouldn't have had... He would have had time. Like, that's kind of ridiculous, but it, visibility was so poor that he might not have known where he was. The idea that he just jumped into a random piece of forest and then somehow, you know, in a business suit made it out is kind of hard awesome. to believe. <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> but a little hard to believe. Um, you know, however... This is a guy that was apparently very well spoken, dressed well. Uh, nobody was reported missing that matched his description. Right? You know, so you this kind guy's of, like an operative man, or well, you, or he got back. He's he got back well, safe. Well, that's what that's what I'm saying. Like he chose the first day of a long weekend. It was American Thanksgiving. So he gives himself maximum time to get back to his life. Like that's to me, the biggest piece of evidence that this guy totally survived. Now they never found any of the money. They know the serial numbers. Nobody's ever found any of the money. Maybe he didn't even want it. Maybe he just wanted to prove that he did it. I mean, I don't know how, you know, you, there's a lot of different ways you can launder money too. So I don't know how that, uh, you know, how that worked. Like where did uh, they look but, for this money all over the world? Like it's never come into circulation. I tried to look that up. That's an interesting question. Like how active are measures currently, for example, to try and find that. And this is, you know, again, I, so I worked at a bank in Canada, uh, We have or had machine. No, they still have. Uh, If you go to any Home Depot, you're going to see the same machine. It's called a CRU. And what it does is you you take the money and you drop it into a uh, very, very thick safe. And as the money's going in, it's scanning it and checking it to make sure it's exactly the right dimensions. And it's, you know, it's supposed to detect counterfeit bills. And one of the other things it was supposed to do was scan the serial numbers. All these units that you see in like Home Depot, you know, any bank that you go into do basically what you would expect. They, they, 
you know, take pictures of the money as it's going in and they um, store it in a, in a safe environment. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, theoretically, banks in the States have a list of these serial numbers and they're on the lookout for them even still. But I mean, I don't know. I tried to look up if there's still any real active measures to find this stuff. Like, I don't know if the banks in Canada are looking out for these bills at this point. It was, you know, yeah, like what about a, years what about ago. a bank in Mexico or... Or something, yeah, right? so like, so I don't know how you know they, they obviously they spent a long time looking for it, but you know the only the only bills that were ever recovered were the ones that those eight that eight year old kid uh, found. Yeah, Which incidentally, uh, sorry, he got I, to keep half of it. That's awesome. That's yeah. how much would that have been like thirty fifteen thousand? Like you said, it was I don't know because those ten. Yeah, um, and well, those bills would be worth just so because they were like degraded to hell. Um, but they'd just be worth so much more just based on their, you know, value. I think he, I read he sold, uh, like 15 of those bills, uh, in like 2009 for like $35,000 or something. They'd, That's you awesome. know, you just hang on to those as they're a collector's yeah, item, right? For sure. Uh, and so, yeah. So like, I, I don't know. I think, I think he made it. I think he was able to, you know, he was able to land without hurting himself too badly he was able to either find a road and hitchhike out of there or um, whatever. But within four days, he was able to get back to his normal life. And, you know, nobody uh, nobody in his life noticed it, that he was gone for that long. OK, so just one more question uh, going back to the money and the uh, sequencing of bills. How old are these yeah. machines? Like <clears throat> you worked in a bank three years ago. We're talking about the 80s, right? Like were things imaging 70s. Every single 70s, okay, 70s, 80s, 90s, even up until, you know, like when did these machines come into effect in banks and how reliable were they? Or were people just periodically checking, I got a stack of bills, I better check a couple of these serial numbers against a random database, which is it just a book where you're, you're going to the number and going, eh, okay, no, that doesn't match. Like, how does that work? Great question. Uh, so yeah, the machines that we're using are not even that old. I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things you do when you work, uh, in, in, in at least the, the one that I did use, you go from branch to branch a bit and I'd work at branches that had older stuff. Um, when I started working, I was only a few years removed from having like drawers, you know, tellers used to have drawers. They used to have to balance at the end of every day. And that's not the case anymore. Now are you just plug everything into this machine and it makes sure that everything gets counted and accounted for. And it's a much better system overall. Right. So um, I'm saying like 20, 30 years ago, they would have just maybe done spot checks on a couple big deposits or something. Right. For sure. And I imagine like at, uh, you know, for let's say even a year after the fact, people are really, oh, I want to find these bills. People are, you know, looking at every, I think it was like L series bill that they, $20 bill they got really checking. But, you know, five years later, is anyone checking? 10 years later, is anyone checking? No. 40 years later, is anybody checking? There's a guy in 2020 relaunched a campaign. He's offering, I think, a $35,000 reward. So if you've got any American $20 bills, maybe check, you know, see if you've you've got one of the DB Cooper bills. But so far, nobody's ever nobody's ever found one. Huh. So, you know, he never if he did use the money, he either used it abroad or, you know, used it somewhere Black or market. laundered it somehow. Yeah. You know, could it's, be something as simple as he bought uh, like property from an old Italian guy who stuffed the money in a mattress. And that's where it is. Maybe, who knows? Yeah. Man, that's it's such a such a badass move, man. Like I just I think if you're the guy. Who knows, like he, the specifics of what he asked the plane to do, like that tells me that he has some kind of understanding and like, there's no internet back then. He's not looking right. Up, he's not looking up ideal paratrooper jump things, specifics about planes. He knew something going into there. Like he had For sure. some kind of, all right, like uh, he knew what was up. I mean, we both come from, you know, we're we're old enough to come from the era of having to look things up in books before, yeah. before the internet. So we can remember the before times when, if you didn't know something, you couldn't just, you just didn't know it. You just didn't know it, you man. Know. Like maybe you went to an encyclopedia in the library and maybe if you were lucky, they had a paragraph in there about what you were researching. Yeah. Like stalactites or something. I have, um, like for my grandma's house, I have the, uh, encyclopedia Britannica kit that might like the collection of books. 
huh. like the leather bound, like the whole yeah. thing that my dad used to use when he was a kid. That was like, he always says like, that was our internet. When yeah, they did homework, some total that was of- what they had to do. And it's, yeah, you're going to get like a paragraph, you know, it's not going to tell you that you can, you know, a 747 at this speed and this height with the wheels down For sure. and the tail down. Like he knew. Wait a minute. Wide berth of topics, shallow berth of knowledge. Are encyclopedias the original fax max? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well played. Ah, but it would have been <laughs> it would have been hard to get that information. You're absolutely right. Like unless you were in the industry or uh, really interested in planes. I don't know. Like it wouldn't have been as, you know, some of that stuff would not be common knowledge. And, for sure. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes I like to, I like to make jokes about America, you know, but America has turned out some badass motherfuckers. <laughs> for sure. Like, dude, they're military guys like fucking kick ass. I mean, are we every, every military person, you know, not to take away from Canadian military, but like, I mean, Especially at that time, because you had World War Two. Ten, not even ten years later, you got Korea. Ten years ish later, you got Vietnam. So every ten years, you got all these badass motherfuckers coming out of the military. With you mean the only one, one of those wars, but <laughs> well, one of them was a policing action. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's right. Forgot about that. Yeah, and one but, of them France started. To be fair, what's that? One of them, France started to be fair. Yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just it's it's uh, you know, like there's a there was a, probably a lot of very, especially at that time, a lot of very capable people. Well, yeah, for sure, and there were a lot of people with very specific skills. There's an right. RCAF guy, um, or not RCAF, um, I think British Admiral guy, basically who said like. You know, the FBI says there's no way he could have done this jump. And then, and then there's this, you know, military guy who said, are you kidding? Like in the Second World War, tens of thousands of, of people made That's that jump saying. all the time. They jumped they jumped overnight in the in, fucking yeah. Normandy, man, like machine right. gun fire, flooded fields. Or they're getting dropped behind enemy lines, maybe into a forest like that, you know, so it's. Yeah. yeah. 100% plausible. Well, 100%. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I just based on the idea that he was never reported missing. That's what makes me believe that he, yeah, he made it back to his, his normal life. What he did with the money. We'll never know. Yeah. And you're saying, like, I don't he, think it will ever know. Like he parachutes. Like, I mean, he could, you know, I think he could have pulled it off. He could have had like, For sure. he could have had like food and water wedged in those, that bomb, you know, like he yep. could have had red tubes full of, uh, food and water and he lands and boom you're off maybe like he's wearing like six layers of thermal underwear under yeah, uh, you exactly. know under his cool suit like you say about, secretly he's sitting there just sweating his balls off the yeah whole time. i mean you say about the cold like i mean you you know you can endure cold you could to an you extent. Could spend entire days outside yeah you get a fire uh, you move th- enough you'll be all right You'll be all right. <laughs> the show was all right. That was a pretty good one, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, this the story of D.B. Cooper. If you want to know about all the people who are suspected to be D.B. Cooper, there's all sorts of, you know, resources for that. That's much better for a visual medium. I just thought, uh, you know, just the story of what happened. People are already, already familiar with it. But, uh, you know, it's it's just a really fun story. This might it's be- a, it's a. It's true crime and mystery, but it's the sort of one where, like, you kind of root for the guy. Yeah, it's totally. right. Like, no one, got, no one got hurt. Yeah, and he pulled one over on the man. Like, who doesn't love a good for story sure. like that? Uh, the uh, the company really is the insurance company was out because the uh, yeah. Norjack, uh, yeah, nor uh, the the airline was reimbursed by an insurance company. The kid who found the bills had to split those bills with the insurance company. Oh, come on, you guys! <laughs> the fuck. Really? Yep. I uh, no way, man. Finders <laughs> keepers. Should have been. Yeah. In that case, like even just for the publicity, what do you want your like nine thousand dollars or something from this eight year old kid? 
Greasy. <laughs> so greasy. Well, Matt, I have a closing fact for you that could extend I'm this excited. episode a lot. <laughs> oh, let's hear it. Have you ever heard of the Office of Planetary Protection? No. Did you know NASA has an Office of Planetary Protection in case life I'm is found by that. on another planet? In case life is found on another planet. So the two uh, from, I think it was from the NASA website. I'd have to pull it up again, but the two, uh, the two caveat, the two like commission kind of statements of this is yeah. carefully control forward contamination of other worlds by terrestrial organisms and organic okay. materials carried by spacecraft in order to guarantee the integrity of the search and study of extraterrestrial life. If it Space, exists, make sure we don't can't contaminate anywhere else. That's one. Yep. <laughs> two okay. rigorously preclude backward contamination of earth by extraterrestrial life or bioactive mo- molecules in return samples from habitable worlds in order to prevent potentially harmful consequences for humans and the earth's biosphere. It is so good that they're doing that. Yeah. So I'm yeah. saying NASA wants to believe I want to believe <laughs> just get on, get on board, man. It's so much more yeah, fun. But, okay. On this but, side. NASA, NASA Here we and go, I folks. believe two more hours. <laughs> NASA and I believe the same thing, though. Like they're worried that either we're going to contaminate a world we're looking for life on, um, in which case it's going to make it impossible to tell whether there was life on there in the first place or whether that was us. Right? They're looking to make sure that we don't significantly contaminate uh, the environment that we're they're playing in. But here's the that that's the interesting thing. They're not worried that we're going to contaminate another world with like a fucking rabbit. They're worried that we're going to contaminate another world with bacteria, which is exactly the sort of life that they're expecting to find on planets or things in our solar system. There's a couple uh, moons like your uh, Jupiter, Europa, where they fully expect that. And I t- totally believe as well. Um, it's probably got an underwater ocean and there's a very good chance because of hydro, um, or sorry, because of tidal heating from Jupiter that there's a liquid ocean Swamp in the core of that. Venus. F- sure. No, there's a liquid, <laughs> uh, uh, ocean underneath the core of this thing. It's entirely possible that there's, you know, bacterial or even multicellular life there. But what it's not is like little green men, you know, coming to visit us. Green. Yeah. <laughs> they can be any color. Or a gray. Well, you know, the grays and the greens are fighting. But uh, isn't that the. Uh, I've, wasn't, wasn't, I've heard was X Files like, like. Things like that. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't X Files. That's just. Yeah. Weird people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think they're worried about the contamination. The contamination they're worried about is exactly the sort of life they expect to find. They also don't want to like accidentally bring a you know, a bacteria back here that turns out that like is, you know, super resistant to, um, you know, all our antibacterials and accidentally wipe out the human race that way. Maybe that's where COVID came from. That's dun, dun, dun. sure. Well, we haven't brought anything back from space. Sure we have. We've, we've brought moon, moon rocks. Well, that was we a long time ago. Moon beams home in a jar. Ha <laughs> Would you like to swing? That was a great show. <laughs> that was a great show. What show was that? Uh, the show was called. I can I can hear the song. I just can't. Yeah, and it was the it was about the girl who uh, um, like her dad was an alien, and he was yeah. like a light in a triangle or something. Yeah, yeah. Man, the eighties were a was wild that? time, weren't they? Oh, they were. 90s, maybe early 90s. Anyhow, Matt, we are going to, like this podcast is going to, I'm going to need another closing fact if we keep going on this topic. <laughs> but I, I'm telling you, we need a good, solid space good, episode. For sure. We'll get spaced out. All right, folks. Well, uh, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.